Hello everyone. I hope you are all doing great. My name is uh, Alexandru Botezatu and today I'll be your moderator. On behalf of PioPetro, I would like you to welcome uh, to today's session about proprietary technology versus engineering design in natural gas uh, processing, presented by our special guest speaker, Dr. Ala Eldin Edris. Dr. Ala Eldin Edris is an Egyptian Canadian scientist and professor of practice of energy engineering at the American University in Cairo. He holds a PhD in chemical engineering from the University of British Columbia, Vancouver, Canada. Uh, and a master's degree in chemical engineering from University of Salford, England. He obtained his bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from Cairo University. Over his professional career, with, which spanned for over three decades, he has been a point of connection between industry and academia, regardless of which side he worked for. Out of seven US patents granted to him, three have made it to full technology in the fields such as uh, chemicals, petrochemicals, and clean energy. Over the past decade, he exerted more effort in the area of research and technology management and technology policy, advising several governmental and non-governmental international entities. He also advises as a gatekeeper on the gate on the stages and gates of the technology commercialization cycle for research and development activities uh, of international corporations. I'm sure you are all excited to be here today. And uh, as a side note, if you have any kind of questions related to this presentation, um, please feel free to write it down in the Q&A section. Uh, now, without any further ado, let's welcome together Dr. Alay Elgin Idris. Doctor. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much. And uh, welcome to all of you for, uh, to, to this uh, lecture. Um, it's it's going to be a little bit of a journey. I will try to take you uh, through um, the, the 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 industry world uh, and an angle of it that's not necessarily a common angle of the industry exposure. I mean, we when we go to internship, we usually get some exposure to the uh, operational part, and uh, if we are uh, in the planning uh, department in one of the uh, uh, companies, we, we we learn a little bit about planning. Maybe sometimes budgeting and so on. But um, what I wanted to give you a flavor of is more on the, the special type of technology that we use and you deal with and you even study it. But the background of this, why is it special? What's the word, the proprietary? What's intellectual property? What's license? I mean, when you hear the word licensed technology, that means somebody have gave somebody else the right to use this technology. So a licensor and a licensee and a certain relationship. So what made this technology different so that somebody would need to give a permit or a permission for other people to use it and definitely they give this permit uh, at a cost. Uh, we will then try to apply this to uh, the gas processing plants something that's closer to your field, where you actually, for many of, uh, of uh, petroleum engineers, they worry more about the uh, upstream and a little bit on the middle stream, which is surface facility, perhaps some uh, oil and gas storage and maybe transportation, but not necessarily the downstream. However, the, um, the licensing and the proprietary technology is all over the chain, it's in the upstream, in the middle stream, and in the downstream. Let me start first by going to some key definitions. Uh, the word, the proprietary technology comes across very often. Many times we come across the word, oh, this is a proprietary technology. No, this is a licensed technology. Let's try to define this and be at least comfortable with the term itself and know what it entails. What does it mean to deal with a proprietary technology? And a proprietary technology involves an application or a tool or a system that belongs exclusively. And please put just one line even in your head on the word exclusively, because we will come back to it uh, uh, more than once, exclusively to an enterprise or an individual. 
So it seems that this is describing a product and perhaps a process. So if I have a, a way of producing a product and you in a different place, in a different country, or maybe in the same country, want to have this uh, ability to produce that product, you come to me and we make an agreement, usually called licensing agreement, and I give you the right to use it. Under which conditions? Negotiable. We agree. We start, we start by saying you are going to make this amount of money if you use this technology. Suppose, for instance, I'll give you just a very simple and lively example, which is the razor blade, what we use to shave our, our beard and so on. The razor blade, for instance, has components that doesn't really exceed like a dollar. It's more or less like plastics and some iron. Yet for four blades, you pay something in the neighborhood of uh, $12 and maybe 15. And that's multiples and multiples of the raw material cost. What made it that expensive? I mean, for any product, you add, you add a markup over the raw material, which is like 40 or 50% or maybe double, but this is 15 times the raw material cost. What made it this way? It's the proprietary technology in it. I mean, if you have the plastic and you have the iron, you can't make a razor, a razor blade and you can't uh, be competitive in making a razor blade because what's behind it is a lot of research. And this is actually what produced the proprietary technology. Those are the, 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 the proprietary technology are generally developed and used by the owner internally and in order to produce or sell a product. Let me give an example of the razor blade, but I also can give an example of a software. Like if you have an, an application on your mobile and you want to use this, this application, for instance, for um, uh, um, map, mapping and, uh, and perhaps searching and so on, there's a price to be paid. Maybe you're not paying it directly, but you're paying this uh, this indirectly, and many, many other examples for products and services that uh, that you need to pay for it. So maybe the the, the developer of the uh, uh, of the product or the process is just have just developed this to use for their own. Okay, so what's wrong with that? I mean, if there's an, an internal thing, uh, it's just their own. So well, but still it needs to be protected because people might want to use it. Maybe an employee wants to take this technology and open his or her own company and start using this knowledge and making profit on it without actually giving the inventor or the person who have made that development and spend the time and effort and mental effort and, and perhaps money into uh, making it in, in a final shape so in order for them, uh, for the originator of the idea to uh, collect a certain return, be protected. And we'll talk about the different forms of intellectual property protection. So in other cases, when the originator or the inventor of the uh, proprietary technology uh, wants to give it to others and, and, and make uh, uh, a return, a financial return on this, they actually do it uh, at a cost. They might go to an end user or maybe a middle person uh, to do that. So the intellectual property in this case, which is the right of your brain effort to use and to give it to others to use. So it came as an idea of your own brain and you want to make sure that nobody can claim rights to it. So it's actually, it needs to be protected in one of the forms that are uh, mentioned in this uh, uh, graph. And let's go through them just one by one. So the type of intellectual properties, they could be an invention, an embodiment, it could be a literary or artistic work, designs, symbols like brands, for instance. Nobody can use the brand of McDonald's or Coca-Cola or Pepsi or Apple. That's actually, it's a big crime. And what makes it a crime 
is the IPR, the Intellectual Property Rights. So uh, they use this for commerce and for making the transaction. It's an important asset and there are uh, a certain values put on each of the, uh, of the brands or the symbols being used. There are different types of intellectual property rights. You may have a right to a patent and a patent is a legal protection of your invention at an institution that's capable of enforcing the rules of the law. So the patent uh, law in almost every country in the world, in the world protect those inventions so that no, nobody can trespass and get it to use it and get away with it. They actually can be penalized, they can go bankrupt and everything. Uh, there's another type of uh, intellectual property rights, which is the copyrights. So if you are, uh, if you are a poet, I mean, you made, a, you made a poem or you wrote a story, a novel and so on, you have copyrights to it and even articles that you publish in scientific journals. And there are the trademarks, things that we just mentioned, like the Mercedes and BMW and Apple and so on, those are basically trademarks and other uh, applications with names. Uh, for instance, uh, Google Maps is a trademark. Uh, there are then protection for designs, and we can get it more exposed to that. And there are protection for databases. And there is another category that's called trade secret. The trade secret is uh, uh, an intellectual property that the inventor does not want to uh, put it in patents, but he put it in uh, a secret document that uh, he or she would only share it with the applicant uh, on the grounds of uh, um, a commercial treaty or a commercial agreement. So those are the six types. And this is in, 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 in another uh, way, the, the, the practices of it. How do we practice patents? How to practice cop copyrights, trademarks, trade secrets? and the right of publicity. When you make a song or a movie, there is uh, another type of right that's called right of publicity, your ability to uh, broadcast, your ability to put this uh, uh, in the public domain and uh, get paid for that. Now, can this right uh, be used, this intellectual property? Can I have a right to use it? Yes, this is called licensing. And the license is an agreement involving the transfer of rights from one party, which is the licensor, to the other party, which is the licensee. And these rights commonly control the use for copying, manufacturing, sale of an IRP, of an intellectual property right. So it could be the use of a patent, the use of a design for a factory or a plant or a device, the use of copyrighted material, which is, could be the novel, or confidential know-how that we are going to uh, agree on licensing it for usage. Now, what, what makes, why does the IP has a value and could be expensive? There are two secrets here for this value. The first secret is R&D, or sometimes we uh, better describe it as RD&D. In institutions and in, in individuals like professors at universities and so on, they're actually sort of like bread and butter is to develop know-how, is to develop knowledge. Some of this knowledge goes to the public domain by publishing and so on, so they increase the pool of knowledge. And some of that knowledge also is kept for application. And this is where you need to go for development behind research, which is the stage of learning more, and demonstration, which is the stage of demonstrating the value of, uh, and the applicability and the operability of what you invented. 
The other secret to this uh, IP is the so-called knowledge-based economy. And let's stop a little bit at, uh, at this knowledge-based economy just to give you a comprehensive uh, view. We will then move to the natural gas, but bear with me uh, on this uh, point a little bit because that's important. This is even uh, very important in understanding the, uh, uh, the example we are giving by natural gas and many, many other uh, life examples that you're going to come across in your professional career. The knowledge-based economy is the third and the highest uh, model of uh, 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 economics of a place or an institution or an entire country. You'll find that we always start by factor-driven economy. That means the resources are the key driver of this economy. If you have enough water, you have enough uh, mines, uh, for gold and, 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 and other uh, minerals, uh, copper and so on, and you have a good land to, to, to grow uh, crops. So this is a factor uh, driven economy. And then the next level up, which requires higher level of knowledge is the efficiency based economy, the efficiency driven. This requires a little bit more skills. There's no, there's, there are limited skills required to, 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 to sell or live on something that was brought to you by nature, you find it this way, but there are more skills required in order to make it a product or to make it an added value uh, asset has a higher value than the factor, the original, the natural asset. Take for instance, for food, I mean, you can grow uh, wheat and you can grow uh, uh, sugar cane, but to make this into uh, sugar to sell is definitely a lot more profitable and a lot more effective way of using your resources. And to make the wheat into a flour, that's a lot more uh, effective. This needs an efficiency. While actually the highest level, which is the knowledge-driven economy, this is when you, your knowledge by itself is, uh, is a value. This is when you actually you sell a license to turn material A into material B. You didn't do anything yourself by producing. You just give somebody else the knowledge to produce it. I'll give you one example right from the petroleum industry. Any group in Italy have actually is the strategic solution or the strategic uh, uh, option that Italy have uh, chosen to penetrate the oil and gas industry. As a matter of fact, Italy almost doesn't have any oil or gas in, in, in its land. Yet, they have enormous reserves through concessions that their company, Eni and, 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 and other engineering companies around them, like Snam Progetti and Technimon, they work using that knowledge that they acquire through education and research and so on to go to somebody else's land where they don't exactly know how to uh, uh, explore, drill and produce and maybe convert this oil and gas into valuable products so that they actually partner on the resource. So you can see that the knowledge driven economy overcomes the scarcity of resources. You might not have actually oil, you might not have gas, but you have the knowledge to help others with the resources so that you can share with them the resource on the basis of your knowledge and on the basis of what you can offer them, what you can add as a value to, uh, to their resources. So I, I hope that this explains a little bit the difference between a factor driven an efficiency driven and a knowledge driven uh, economy. We can give many, many examples of uh, 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 resource uh, driven solutions uh, that are resource, uh, resource based uh, assets that are hard to be exploited or used without the knowledge that complement them. And you can find right away that in the world, the GDP, the gross domestic product uh, of nations, 
that it is very much dependent on how much knowledge you have rather than how much resources you have. And the correlation is, is very clear in this. Uh, and I invite you all to check yourself the GDP of different countries and relate them to the natural resources available to them. Last thing that I want to say about the uh, uh, proprietary technology and the knowledge-based economy uh, before we move to the natural gas processing industry is the components and the elements of a knowledge-based environment. So an environment that can create a knowledge-based economy is one that has an educational system, which is very solid and robust, an innovation system, uh, which in, involves the protection of the innovation rights and the freedom to innovate, access of data and so on. The business surrounding, because in, inventors wants to interact with businesses, talk to them, see what their needs are, offer them solutions, interact on the basis of uh, uh, piloting their, uh, their solutions or new inventions in an industrial setting and in a business uh, uh, setting. Uh, there are regional aspects that has to do with the surrounding resources available, environment around them. I mean, when people in first invented the cellular phone or mobile phone, it was actually a solution for people who get trapped in the ice in Scandinavia when they don't, when they don't have uh, a connection to the world to tell people that they are trapped in an avalanche or something, they can die. So the, the, the invention here was a mandate, it was a must. And then it, become, it became a cellular phone and then it became part of our life that we can't actually live without it pretty much. Uh, the information and communication system needs to be very robust, very solid. And the knowledge management in organizations also needs to be robust. And I'm, I'm not gonna talk a lot about knowledge management. Uh, it's a, an area that probably requires um, uh, a lecture on by, by, its own, by its own. So natural gas processing industry, let's go back to what the natural gas looks like and how it comes out of the wellhead. What, what we define as the natural gas is not actually a component that we can describe. We can say that, for instance, it's mainly ethane or it is an ethane or methane or propane. It's actually a collection of hydrocarbons. Some of them could be condensated, can be turned into liquid, and uh, some of them are permanent gases, meaning a uh, normal temperature and pressure, they can never be liquefied, and you need an additional energy to liquefy them. And some of these components are non-hydrocarbons, like CO2 and H2S, there's a lot of water as well into this. And a lot of impurities, depending on the well, depending on the conditions, the reservoir itself affects the, uh, uh, the impurity uh, level. You can have mercury, there are mercaptans and so on. So natural gas is such an amazing uh, mix of different things. And this is the problem then, because treatment of the gas is always required in order for it to be suitable for various applications to make a value out of it. As a matter of fact, using natural gas as is doesn't worth anything. And, and, and in fact, you can't even use it because with the amount of sulfur that it carries with it, you can't even burn it in, uh, in, a, in a feasible way. It will corrode all the uh, piping, it will hurt the burners and, 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 and it will send out a smoke that's full of uh, of SO2 that's poisonous. I mean, so a treatment of a natural gas, which is what we call natural gas processing, is mandated merely by the nature of what we are obtaining out of the, uh, of the grounds. <laughs> there are different uh, uh, gas processing systems available, and we'll look into this in a little bit. And the gas processing systems, because they are actually competing and many of them are coming from very strong background and from uh, uh, very solid uh, technological solutions. Uh, 
they are a little bit confusing for a plant owner. Suppose now you are a plant owner and you have this concession and you are producing certain millions of uh, cubic uh, feet of natural gas a day uh, and you want to install a treatment plant. I'm sure without a serious technical help, you have a problem in identifying which one to go to. But not only because of these options are different and competitive, but also because you have certain specifications that you want to meet. You have certain uh, definition of what is it exactly that you want to produce because you have a market to serve. You didn't produce the natural gas for a single application. And also, you do, you do not use it yourself. Most of the time, you are producing the natural gas from the well so that you can sell it to an end user. This end user has specifications and there are contracts between you and that end user to deliver according to specs. Anything that's off specs, you pay for it. So you lose, end of the day. So you need to look at the market uh, that you're going to serve and put the specs, then dive deeply into the variety of processing systems you and your consultants and your engineering advisors and your technology advisors in order to take this into the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the choices that will fit your uh, specifications and the market you are serving. <laughs> this variety of processes and options really places a huge burden and challenges on the owner to select the right technologies because there are project circumstances, there are geographical challenges, and uh, what you all, always look for, and, and every uh, owner of uh, a gas source or a gas well would be looking for is an optimized scheme that's meeting both the technological and the economical target of, uh, of the market they are serving. This is... Um, a typical natural gas processing plant, and don't be worried about the uh, little complexity. It's, it's very simplified, but looks uh, still a, a little complex. But let's go through it and, and see what are the key processes that we need to deal with in order to produce end of the day, what we can see here on the, on the right, which is the, uh, uh, the end the product uh, being put in a pipeline for power generation or the liquefied product that's going to be trucked or put in a pipeline for transportation, perhaps to uh, uh, a petrochemical plant for uh, making products like uh, polypropylene that we use as a plastic or other polyethylene that is very uh, common in our lives now, or uh, the going to other uh, additives or making gasolines or additive to the gasoline through the condensate. But I want you to focus on these four uh, uh, yellow uh, uh, boxes with the, uh, with the yellow. And let's consider that those are the ones that, uh, that actually constitute a challenge for us. Uh, all of them do constitute a challenge. I just wanted to select uh, uh, some of the, uh, of the blocks just to take it as a case study and look into what kind of options we have, how to select those options and so on. So we'll take the dehydration, which is the water removal. We'll take the gas treating system and the, uh, uh, the gas sweetening uh, uh, system. Uh, I'm sorry, there seems to be doubling here with dehydration, sorry for that. Uh, um, and, and the uh, uh, sulfur removal, I guess, have better. Yes, let's, let's uh, look at this. We have, we, we, we have here the, uh, the acid gas removal, the, the, the dehydration, the mercury removal, and we said mercury is one of the impurities that we need to get rid of, and the tail gas uh, treatment. There is also the uh, sweetening uh, uh, unit which, uh, through which we can produce the, um, uh, the, the fractionated products. We call them fractionated because we were able to split them into layers based on their boiling point ranges 
and this would be ethane, propane, butane, and the pentenes plus anything that's above uh, the pentenes. <coughs> All right. Now, this is, this is pretty much what we want to focus on and, and, and look at how many options we have for uh, licenses and what are their characteristics and what are the uh, choices we have when we look at the process plant itself. Now we are assuming that we are designing this, right? So we start fresh, we have the raw gases coming and they'll go just to slug catcher and from slug so capture we have the gases and want to treat this to make it usable for anyone We're going to uh, an end user. So we have gas sweetening unit, dehydration, removing the emer captains, you have the mercury removal, and we have the sulfur removal unit plus the tail gas treating uh, unit. So those are the, th the, the four units that we want to use and that we want to design for. That once we say there are four units and they are proprietary, that means each of these blocks has a licensor and there will be a contract for each of them. So there will be a study that doesn't only say uh, whether this is a suitable uh, uh, license or a technology step for uh, the gas sweetening or the gas dehydration or the captain removal, we ask more critical questions. As a designer, we ask whether the performance guarantee on this unit, and let me explain what performance guarantee means. A performance guarantee is the commitment of the licensor to the licensee that if you put your raw gas into this unit, with the objective of removing sulfur, we are going to remove 99% of the sulfur in this gas, right? If, if we only remove 95%, we pay you money because you're gonna lose money. This is called a performance guarantee. And that's a very important article in the contract between the licensor and the licensee. So, we have to look at the performance guarantee. We have to look at the ability of the uh, unit that we are going to take a license for to deal with the raw gas, right? The raw gas is coming, carrying different uh, uh, components. And if the unit is sensitive to say, for instance, uh, uh, a certain percentage of H2S or a certain percentage of deposited carbon coming from heavier hydrocarbons. And this sensitivity will affect the efficiency of the unit. So the unit will not perform. The, the unit will not give the results that you are interested in. So anyone who's studying the suitability of a license, they will need to look at the feedstock, whether it is the unit can tolerate it, need to look at the deliverable output and the linkage between the output of the first unit to feeding the second unit. Like for instance here in the gas sweetening unit, this output coming uh, uh, as a product of the gas sweetening should have a CO2 that's less than 50 ppm per volume, part per million in volume. If it goes to the gas dehydration and the Mercaptan's removal unit with 60 or 70, and that dehydration uh, unit is sensitive to CO2, that means the unit will not perform, the dehydration unit will not perform. The entire plan for the gas uh, treatment will not deliver the specs that actually I'm expecting at the output. So if I deliver this to the market, to the uh, uh, end user or the customer that I contracted with, we would not accept it. It would be something called off-spec. So an off-spec means something that did not meet our agreement to deliver uh, 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 according to specific uh, specifications. Meaning I told you when we agreed that you're gonna give me uh, a natural gas uh, that has uh, this amount of CO2, this amount of sulfur, this amount of uh, carbon deposits, this amount of 
heavy hydro hydrocarbons because my usage will not tolerate higher percentage of those. So you have a maximum. And if you exceed that, actually, I'm not going to take this batch of, uh, of product uh, from, uh, from your uh, factory or your pipeline where you're selling it. The, the large numbers of uh, number of, of, of package vendors, we call the providers of those licenses and technologies, and the provider of gas dehydration unit, the GDU, this is called a vendor. And, and a vendor, because they deliver this unit as a block of almost black box thing, you're not supposed as a licensee to open it or alter it or change it. You don't do anything with it. You just call them if you have an issue with that. And this is basically because you don't have the technical knowledge to get into it and change anything with that. Although it happens in, in some areas, in some places that people get into uh, this and maybe they are successful also and make a better use of it. Uh, so the, 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 the license contract that uh, we need for each of, of those uh, units and steps to include performance guarantees and well-defined border limits for the different interfaces. What we mean by interfaces is this actually arrow between the gas sweetening and the gas dehydration. This is an interface and this is extremely important for the engineering design firm to make sure that this interface is, is actually adequate an interface between the two units, that output and input do match at this point so that we don't get a, a conflict of specifications. That means the specifications of the output here does not really meet the expectations of the input to the gas dehydration unit and so on. Same for mercury removal and the natural gas liquid recovery unit and so on. The, the, the other, other aspect of the unit optimization uh, uh, is that the, uh, the, 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 there are certain security measure margins for each one, meaning when, when they tell you, I mean, when the licensor or the vendor of the unit tells you that this unit actually will deliver uh, not more than uh, five uh, ppm per volume of CO2 at the output, they protect themselves a little bit. We call this security margin. They know that they can take it down to two, right? But they won't only make a legal commitment on five ppm, because if they make a legal commitment on two and there are operational flexibility or operational variations, you actually can sue them. You can take them to court. If you, you promised of delivering unit that's gonna make it to uh, two ppm, I got 3.5. So I can, I'm gonna sue you, you can pay me for the loss of opportunity for the loss of product because this product it wasn't, wasn't sold, it was not accepted. So what they do is they make their experimentation and make their all their trial and R&D work to produce the product at 2 ppm, but they put in the guarantee that you need to tolerate up to 5 ppm. So those uh, uh, security margins, they are good because they protect the vendor, but sometimes you need to know of them because they might be not acceptable to subsequent unit or downstream units. So you need to be aware of those limits so that the matching and the integration of the different uh, package units or the different licensed units are not hurting your entire uh, plant operation. Let's have a look at the, the different licensors or the licensing approaches or choices for the gas treatment plant. There are actually three approaches. And uh, the first one has three options. This is a real life uh, example here. And the first approach, which includes those three solutions is to give the entire gas processing plant to one technology vendor, one licensor, 
we have options here of Lurgy, Shell, and Total. Lurgy, Shell, and Total have devised an entire solution. They did have the knowledge of all four units that we just talked about. And they were able also to put them together in an integrated and optimized fashion in a way that a normal engineering company probably can do, cannot do better than them because they have the ins and outs of knowledge for each and every one of the units. They have simulators, they can simulate them well. They have the ability to change some factors between uh, those units. So they have uh, a comprehensive solution for the entire four options. But we're not out of options. We have two other options. Not if we decided that the price or the cost of the license is so high. And let me explain that the cost could be one time pay. So I'm going to take this for $7 million, like license to use. Or it could be a royalty. I mean, the licensor can ask for a percentage of the sales of your product. And this is becoming uh, also uh, more common. Uh, usually in, in a license, you also uh, part of the agreement is that you get the updates of the technology uh, against a certain fees and so on. So uh, suppose that we now chose not to take one uh, full integrated uh, technology from one, one of the three licensees like Lurgy, Shell, or Total, and we are going to go for a combining uh, of different technology licensors. I'm not gonna actually uh, 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 take one, one solution, but I'm gonna take the best solution for each of the four units. So I, I like more the, uh, the solution of Johnson, Matthew, or uh, Snap Project T for the dehydration. And I like for the desulfurization or the mercaptan removal, another technology from Japan, Mitsubishi, and for this, I mean, I, I like more the other one, but I mean, I can, as an as, as engineer and, 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 and technically savvy, we can make this judgment, but there is a caveat zone. I mean, there is, there's a warning here that the, the contracts and the guarantees and the liabilities are actually going to be taken a lot more carefully than taking this from one uh, licensor. It's like, you know, when you buy uh, a vehicle, a car, uh, a passenger car, and you buy it as uh, from one uh, vendor like Mercedes or Toyota, or you decide to get an engine from one uh, vendor and the muffler from another and the salon from a, a third one and the structure from a fourth one, and you plan, I mean, and, and you are a good mechanical engineer and everything, but you wanted to assemble it yourself. Now, then, then you might have uh, uh, a trouble in getting uh, the right combination and the right interfaces. You remember the word interface, the unit and the unit, are they matching the, the, the same standard? Do they, they really talk together well? Uh, the, the, the mismatch in some of the design margins can really affect uh, your CAPEX and OPEX. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if you are familiar with the term CAPEX and OPEX, but those are the capital cost and the OPEX is the operating cost. And those are important factors in making many, many, almost every decision in industrial choices. So sometimes the, the, the different contracts, different guarantees that you got from different vendors and their integration and their security margins could cost you extra because you, you, you want them, because since they are not integrated, you want them to make that match in yourself and ask for more tolerance and ask for more guarantees and liabilities on the vendor so they need to pay more. I mean, they can probably give you what you want but you have, there is a price for every additional specification that you're gonna put on, on, this, uh, uh, on, on this license. Now, that, what, what if I don't wanna take anything from anyone? I don't wanna have a license whatsoever. I wanna do this design 
uh, by myself using an engineering company and using the so-called the open art processes. Open art processes meaning that there is no really license or fees or proprietary uh, information involved in it. I'm gonna design it from the references and databases in the open literature. And as a matter of fact, you can, but basically you cannot design uh, an efficient uh, unit using open art, simply because the available information are not covering the specifics and the years of R&D that those companies have invested in to come up with a unique solution. The reason why it became a license and it became a proprietary technology is that it is a unique solution and it is an enhanced and improved and optimized solution that will give you a benefit, that will give you an efficiency or a product specification that you cannot achieve it using the open uh, uh, art processes. Yet some people are forced to do this. Examples, for instance, are the, uh, the countries under technology embargoes, like South Africa during the proletary uh, uh, Pretoria's uh, time, and Iran under the, uh, uh, the uh, boycotting. Um, they, they, they don't have access to many of the technologies. So they actually, they resort to building plants using open art processes and keep enhancing on those and improving the R&D uh, making uh, better, uh, better efficiency, better performance. Sometimes it even drives to very good technologies like the, the what Cecil in, uh, in South Africa have came up actually with quite good uh, uh, solutions and the processes, chemical processes and, and, and oil treatment processes during the uh, boycotting time. One other level of uh, uh, technology licensing, which usually is uh, associated with uh, uh, the, 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 the chemical processes and associated with the use of what we call the, 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 the unknowns of the chemical process industry, the unknowns of the petroleum uh, processing. Not really fully unknown, but they are uh, very restricted information. I will take the example of the methanol and ammonia plant. Those are natural, uh, important value-added products that come from natural gas that you guys are producing. And it has a process that's actually simplified here so that we can go through it quickly as we are approaching the end of this webinar. Yeah, the process has uh, a sulfur removal, a pre-reforming, uh, primary reforming, secondary reforming, and then uh, a methanol synthesis. Uh, then it goes through separation steps uh, of distillation, methanation, and then ammonia synthesis. I don't wanna bore you with a lot of details about this, but I want you to know one thing, that there are here six reactors involved in this, right? There are, uh, I'm sorry, there are seven reactors. Each of these reactors, chemical reactors, has a catalyst in it. And if you don't know what the catalyst is, it's the, actually the agent that we put to help the reaction progress and selectively produce a certain uh, product. Why actually I'm, I'm putting this because this is more towards petrochemicals than petroleum, because I just wanted you, you to be aware of that not only we, 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 we need the, uh, the licenses for uh, the downstream processing of natural gas to separate it and make it a product, but we even in more need of licenses and very proprietary technology when we want to create more value out of it. Remember, uh, when, when we produce uh, natural gas for uh, power generation, for instance, to be uh, burned for producing electricity uh, or for uh, other uh, fuel uh, um, uh, usage, like cars and, and vehicles and so on, this is a medium degree of value addition. 
The real value addition is when you convert it to useful products, when you convert it to methanol, when you convert it to ammonia, which is a, an important part of a fertilizer called urea. This is what we use to, uh, uh, to fertilize uh, land to make, uh, to grow products. So although I didn't wanna focus too much on uh, this part, but I wanted you to be at least familiar with the term reactors and catalysts, and that those uh, are critical elements of any value added processes to produce high value products like methanol, like ammonia, like polyethylene, polypropylene, uh, polystyrene, styrene butadiene rubber, which we make uh, tires from and so on. All these are petrochemicals coming from uh, what you guys produce in the uh, wellhead, but after a lot of steps of processing, many of them are proprietary technology. Take, for example, this uh, methylol and ammonia. I tried to look at who is actually licensing this, and you'll find that there is an alliance between uh, KBR, which is a British company, and Johnson Matthey uh, for licensing ammonia and methanol co-production uh, uh, technology. Uh, Johnson Matthey is uh, a metal uh, producer, and one of their strength points is that they can secure the metal required to make the catalyst. Um, it's another linkage that I didn't want to um, uh, waste more time uh, on it. But uh, there is a lot of industrial network of uh, material and benefits from uh, material that you can uh, that you can use and produce. Uh, there is Holder Topsu, the German uh, giant, and there's Mitsubishi, and by way of uh, example of, um, uh, of licenses and different uh, tracks of uh, license for uh, a company like Mitsubishi, which we all know about it as, um, uh, as a car manufacturer and making some other products, but their actually presence in the chemical world is huge. And they do licenses for all these technologies and more, uh, of course. Key takeaways of this uh, uh, webinar that I hope you come out of it with some exposure to what, what is intellectual property and what's proprietary technologies. Uh, what is it? Uh, that requires license and, uh, and uh, if a know-how is uh, produced by a party and ready for licensing to another party, what kind of deal and arrangement they need to make, it's called licensing and it has a lot of terms on uh, how to use it, on what to pay for it, the limits of using it, uh, the, uh, uh, the limitations and liability if it doesn't work and so on. And all these are really deeply embedded into engineering design world. I mean, the, uh, uh, for any of, of you or any of us who will be engaged in engineering design, they, they would, no matter what, they get exposed to intellectual property, to licenses, the know-how, the technology, the proprietary technology, they get to, do, they get to need, they need to uh, uh, to know of this, and even in operation, you will be uh, you will encounter a lot of the units and the devices that are uh, actually uh, proprietary. Uh, and I I also wanted you to know that the proprietary technologies are fundamental enablers, but also a product of the knowledge driven economy. I really encourage you to read more about knowledge-driven economy and what it entails in terms of ecosystem and how it is very impactful for poverty alleviation, for, uh, for national uh, well-being and so on. Uh, the third uh, takeaway here is that the engineering design is, uh, is restricted to open art processes, but not proprietary process technologies. I'll give you just one simple example. Uh, petroleum refining, for instance, is an open art process. You don't really need in the refining itself to have anything proprietary. Sometimes you can get improvement by having maybe a proprietary agent for uh, certain separation step and so on, 
but all the destination columns and the scrubbers and the flash drums and so on, they are just design uh, exercises that does not require a proprietary uh, technology or a license or uh, in, in, in the design. And so you design really, you engineer, you build, you install, you start it up and you just put your controls in, and that's easy. Anything that goes beyond uh, fractionation and separation of uh, petroleum fractions, most of probably you would be in, you'll encounter uh, a need for a proprietary process. Uh, by way of example, the requirements of a strategic uh, and important technology with respect to competitive forces uh, for gas processing plants that we just give an example with, it dictates the, that the most effective treatment uh, uh, process technology should have, and this is actually more of a criteria, how I'm going to that uh, uh, choose that that technology or technology combination or one of the three solutions that we uh, discussed, uh, it should be able to comply with the sulfur specifications for gas and liquid products. So sulfur removal is a key in uh, gas treatment and natural gas treatment. So it has to meet the uh, the requirements of both the gas and liquid product. Because from natural gas, we also sell liquid, which is called the condensate upon the separation, what we, do, what we do in a flash drum. And to be able to process different feeds, because in a well, uh, you don't always get the same composition from that field. At the beginning of the uh, production, it's different from the middle and it's different from the end of the production. So you need to design for, to tolerate different compositions, different feed compositions uh, uh, along the lifetime of, uh, of, um, of a well. And, and the third is to be cost effective compared to other alternatives. So you, do, you, you, you measure on the basis of, uh, of cost. And in cost, remember that there are two elements of cost that we need to worry about, the capex and the opex. Capex is the uh, uh, capital investment that you make and OPEX is your operating cost. Sometimes you can get a very uh, cost effective design uh, in terms of capital. You don't spend a lot at the beginning, but you, 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 you spend a lot during operation because it has consumables or agents that you pay a lot to, uh, to provide or it uses a lot of energy that you also pay a lot to, uh, to get. Uh, last point is uh, the other considerations to our example of gas treatment unit is to be fully aware of the reliability record of the uh, license or the technology that you're going to uh, have a license for, corrosion performance, quality of the process guarantee, that means it's legally binding or not legally binding, there's a term and the guarantee uh, that's written in a very gray uh, way or a very hazy way that, uh, that you can uh, commit the licensor to the, uh, any of the uh, lack of performance. Uh, that's very important. And this is legal in the sense that a lawyer actually end up working with the engineer to put those terms in, in, in a very delicate way. Uh, the availability of uh, professional support after the sale and the, and, and, and the technical service that you're going to get. Um, we can add to this a few other considerations that I, I myself, during my uh, work in industry and when I used to license uh, technologies, uh, we also look at the uh, further development of this technology. Because if I license today and something else is, uh, came up or a competitor uh, came up with something that's uh, uh, much more advanced, I'm stuck with this technology. I already paid for it. So I don't want to be uh, actually stuck with a technology that does not evolve. So there has to be a commitment from the licensor, the technology uh, producer or the inventor, that they will keep developing and improving their technology so that their technology after a few years won't be obsolete or uh, lagging behind in terms of uh, uh, performance. Um, thank you very much, and I would be really happy to answer your questions, and I hope that this was 
uh, useful and added few uh, in, in enlightening uh, angles of the industry life. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like uh, to uh, read to you some questions from our audience. One of the questions is: Can you can you explain again the difference between large shell and total? Between L between uh, large shell and total, the company. Yeah, well, we we, we don't want to get into their uh, their specific sort of like advantage and uh, and what what do they st they stand? All what I was trying to state here uh, is. There are, uh, we, we, we have actually three options that I can put here. One of them is one licensor for the entire treatment unit, which has four units under the treatment plant, right? Uh, uh, one option is the one licensor. And it happens that those available as one licensor for an integrated solution for the four units is Lurgi, Shell, and Total, right? So the, the three companies offer integrated solution. And there is the combined uh, uh, combination of license source, and this could be any of those and others as well. I mean, there are at least 12 others that offer one unit, but not the other and, and stuff like that. So in this case, we compare Apple to Apple for each of the four units. That's the second approach. The third approach was the open art processes, only design, no license. Okay, thank you very much. Um, another question is related to the third slide, and it's about uh, franchised products. Uh, sorry, franchise what? Franchised products, if you can explain yes. more about this. Yeah, franchise products are actually, usually we don't franchise products, we franchise operation, right? So for instance, uh, 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 McDonald's can give a franchise to somebody to operate, right? While the pro the products is more of an agency rather than a franchise, right? So a franchisee gets the right from the fr franchisor to use their operation and sell products or offer a service. So if I, for instance, uh, Gold's Gym is an international uh, gym law, and they give franchise to a Gold's Gym in Istanbul or in Cairo or in Riyadh. And they do this because they have a procedure and they have certain uh, machines, training standards, and so on. So they give it to a franchisee so that they can practice in their area and in their territory. So uh, the franchising is more related to the uh, operation. While actually the products, you just give agency. I mean, and, and you don't really fran franchise uh, to um, uh, um, uh, a BMW, for instance, to, uh, to to make BMWs. I mean, that's very unlikely. And there's assembly line and so on. But but there are uh, agencies of BMW everywhere, right? Because they take their products and they sell it. So this actually the product representation we call them uh, regional or country representation. Thank you very much. Um, another question is about the rights to use an uh, intellectual property and uh, um, the deal between the licensor and licensee. Uh, is the deal affected by country, like it is different from country to country? That's a very good question. That's a very good question because, yes, it gets affected from one country to another because the, the intellectual property law is different from one country to another, right? And even the way you protect your technology and your idea is also different from one country to another. You can protect, you can, in some countries, you can have something called the provisional patent that's active for a year until you put a full patent in. In some other countries, you know, you have to fill in the entire, the, the full patent from the very first day. What happens in the time of the first year uh, when you have this right in one, under one law, is that you give yourself a chance to improve and put your best after one year. While actually in other countries, you need to wait until your research is complete and your development, and then you go and file a patent and protect your invention. So those are very, uh, very different from one country to another. Again, for the legal uh, aspect of the contract, they are varying, but you know what? Sometimes we write those licensing agreements and, in, in the agreement terms, 
we resort to a law that's different from the countries we, we sign in. I've signed agreements by itself uh, 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 while working in, in Saudi Arabia or in, in, in the US, in, in Canada, uh, and in Egypt that refers to the British law, right? So it's just that the two parties did not want, the licensor and the licensee, did not want to use a national or each of them wanted to use their national law, but they agreed that since they cannot come to terms, let's use a third country law to govern this agreement, and they write in the agreement, and any uh, conflict uh, will be resolved in that third country. And this is common. It happens all the time. Thank you very much. Um, the last question will be, how much it takes to grant uh, a patent? And uh, it, this depends uh, by country to country. Yeah, uh, it, it does. I mean, uh, it, it, patent offices are really places that have always been sort of like notorious for having a big backlog. The most famous patent office, of course, is the US patent office because of the uh, law endorsement is quite uh, significant. What happens is uh, it's, it depends on the field. So for instance, for healthcare, it runs much faster than industrial processes. In the IT, it's faster uh, than agriculture, for instance. So it really depends on the discipline where you want to do the protection. Uh, in average, I can guess some two and a half to three years for industrial patents uh, in the US. In Canada, it used to be a little bit longer. Uh, in other countries, it's not uh, stable. Sometimes it gets through very quick. Sometimes it takes longer time because those are offices with no uh, uh, routine flow. I mean, they don't have really a standard expectations. While in the US, you know that you are expecting per year, uh, for instance, something like 200,000. So you design the office to have enough uh, patent examiners who would allow it that match this but you can't have enough, so you have some backlog. It, it's really different from one country uh, uh, to another. Okay, Dr. Edith, so uh, those are all, all the questions. Thank you very much for this uh, insightful presentation in France Thank and our patients. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Uh, as a reminder to our attendees, uh, please do not forget to submit the quizzes. And uh, on behalf of Biopetro, I wish you all a wonderful weekend. See you next time.